In this session, I'd like to talk about currencies, why they matter, and how to bring them into analyses, whether it's financial or economic. Now, until about three or four decades ago, all you had to do was learn how to deal with your domestic currency. So if you're a US analyst, you learned about the US dollar, and to the extent that foreign currencies matter, it wasn't a big deal. If you're an Indian analyst, you dealt primarily or only in Indian rupees. Now, with globalization, we have to get comfortable moving across currencies because you should be able to value a company in Indian rupees, US dollars, euros, or Japanese yen. So to understand currencies, let's crack the currency code. The key reason for differences across currencies is not country risk, because that we can deal with, it's inflation. Currencies with higher inflation rates will tend to have higher interest rates, and currencies with lower inflation rates will tend to have lower interest rates. Now don't jump to any conclusions. Because by itself, you're saying higher interest rates are bad, they will lower my value, not so fast. To understand why currencies matter, and ultimately should not, let's take a look at interest rates across currencies. In this graph, you see government bond rates in different currencies in July of 2020. Now, government bond rates incorporate inflation, but they also include country risk. There are some countries, when the government issues a bond, that interest rate will reflect the risk in that government. So here's what I've tried to do. I've taken each government bond rate and taken out of it the portion that can be attributed to government default risk. Now, this is an estimate that I've made based on the rating for the government and how much risk I see. But the red portion of the graph is what's left. That is my risk-free rate in different currencies. So let's start by stating what seems to be an unassailable fact. Risk-free rates vary across currencies. And the only reason or the key reason they vary is because of differences in inflation. Higher inflation currencies will have higher risk-free rates. Lower inflation currencies will have lower risk-free rates. And currencies with deflation could have negative risk-free rates. We'll come back and talk a lot more about this in the context of valuation in corporate finance. But that's something we need to get on the table. Now, you'll notice there are only about 40 currencies listed on this graph. You're saying, what about the other currencies? Why aren't there risk-free rates in those currencies? The reason is very simple. Many currencies do not have a government bond denominated in that currency. So you're saying, how do I get a risk-free rate in that currency? Well, if inflation is the key reason for differences across currencies, there is a simple way in which you can go from one currency to another and get a risk-free rate in a currency, even if you cannot find a government bond rate. You just use the differential inflation rate. Let me give you a very simple example of how this would work. Let's suppose you want to get a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds. There were no 10-year government bond rates denominated in 10-year bonds denominated in Egyptian pounds in December of 2015. So here's what I did to get an Egyptian pound risk-free rate. I started with a US dollar risk-free rate. Then I used the T-bond rate as my estimate. Let's say it's 2.27%. To get a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds, here are the two numbers I need to estimate. One is an expected inflation rate in the US dollar. Let's say it's 1.5%. The other is an expected inflation rate in Egypt. Now, all you might have is last year's inflation. For the moment, let's go with that. Let's say it's 9.7%. I'm almost home free. If I'm in a hurry to get my risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds, here's what I will do. I will take the US dollar risk-free rate, 2.27%. Take the difference in inflation rates, which is 8.2%, 9.7 minus 1.5, and add the two numbers together. That's going to give me about 10.47%. That's an approximation. Why an approximation? Because there's a compounding effect that kicks in here. Inflation builds on top of interest rates. If you want to be precise, here's how you bring it in. You take 1 plus the US dollar risk rate, rate. that's 1.0227. And you multiply it by 1 plus the inflation rate in, the, in Egyptian pounds, 9.7%, 9, 9 1.097, divided by 1 plus the inflation rate in US dollars. You get a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds of 10.53%. Now, remember, the shortcut got you to 10.4. So if you're in a hurry, there's nothing wrong with using the shortcut. But if you have the time, might as well do a try. So that's why interest rates vary across currencies. At this point, you're probably puzzled. Higher inflation currencies have higher interest rates. Higher interest rates should lower value, right? Well, not really, and here's why. When you do a project analysis, you have to be currency consistent. What does that mean? If you decide to do your discount rate in Egyptian pounds, you get a high discount rate. That cannot be contested. But that same 
Okay, analysis should have your cash flows in Egyptian pounds. You think, so what? The same inflation that gets built into your discount rate will also help you on your cash flows. High inflation currencies will have high discount rates and much higher growth rates. If you are currency consistent, your value or analysis of projects should be currency invariant. What does that mean? If your company is undervalued in US dollars, it should stay undervalued in rupees. We'll come back and address this much more specifically later on. But remember, when you pick a currency, you have to be consistent all the way through. Now, if you decide to do your analysis in Egyptian pounds, not only should your discount rate be in pounds, but your cash flows have to be in pounds, right? Now, to convert your cash flows into pounds in future years, you need expected exchange rates. So let's talk about exchange rates. If you decide to be currency consistent, you often have to forecast exchange rates. In some currencies, you may be able to find a market-based numbers. In others, you might have to forecast your own. In fact, I'm going to give you two parity conditions you can use to forecast exchange rates. I didn't make these up. These have been around forever. One is called interest rate parity. That's built on the fact that if you did not, if you have interest rates in two currencies, exchange rates for the future are bound by those interest rates. I'll come back and talk more about this. The second is what's called purchasing power parity. We use differences in inflation. Put very broadly though, there are three ways in which you can forecast exchange rates. One is you can hire an expert or be the expert to forecast future rates based on what your perceptions of a currency are, whether it's strong or weak and what you think will happen to the fundamentals. The second is to trust market forecasts, forward rates, future rates. The third is to use the parity conditions, interest rate parity and purchasing power parity. Let's talk about the pluses and minuses of each. Now, if you hire an expert or you do your own forecast, let's start with a reality check. Exchange rate forecasting is not very well done. In fact, like much of macroeconomic forecasting, it barely beats random forecasts. So to begin with, if you claim to be an exchange rate forecaster, you have to have something backing it up. But even if you believe you're good at forecasting exchange rates, you have to be careful about bringing in those forecasts into your analysis. Let's say you're doing a project analysis. Let's say it's a Brazilian project and you have very strong views on the Brazilian RIA and you bring in those strong views into your forecast of exchange rates and into your cash flows. You know what you have to worry about? Your results will be muddied, muddied by the fact that what you find for the project, whether it's a good project or a bad project, is as much a function of your views on exchange rates as it is of, of your views on the project. Same thing can be said about valuation. If you value a company with your very explicit forecast of exchange rates, your valuation is going to be a joint product of both your views and exchange rates and your views of the company. You might say, so what? Let's say you're really good at forecasting exchange rates. Why are you even valuing companies or taking projects? There's a much easier way for, for you to make money. Just go out and play the exchange rate market. So if you're really good at forecasting exchange rates, why are you even doing financial analysis? And if you're not very good, why muddy the waters? So I'm, a very, I'm very skeptical about using expert or personal forecasts. The second choice is to use market forecasts. In the last few decades, we've seen forward and futures markets develop on many currencies. And if you're working with currencies like the US dollar and euro, you can get forward rates for one year out, two years out, 10 years out. What does it allow you to do? Get a market estimate of what the exchange rate will be 10 years from now. You think this is good? I'm going to argue there's a lot less information than you think in those forward markets, but at least you have a market set rate. Now, there are some currencies where you're not going to get that lucky. In many emerging market currencies, there might be forward markets, but they won't run 10 years out. They might run a year, two years out. And in some currencies, there will be no market rates at all. You have to negotiate a forward contract with a bank and the bank will set the rates. But in some currencies, their market forecasts might as well use them. But let's talk about what these forward rates include. For instance, these are the forward rates for the US dollar euro on, uh, on July 24th of 2020. So you can see I can get one year, two years, all the way out to 10 years. So if I'm a company with a US company with European cash flows or Euro cash flows, I can lock in the rate at which I can convert these cash flows into the future. And if you have this and you have to convert your US dollar cash flows into Euro cash flows or vice versa, you can use these forward rates. But let's now talk about the scenarios where you don't have market set rates. 
Well, one condition that holds forward rates together is what's called interest rate parity. Interest rate parity is an arbitrage condition. What does that mean? If you deviate from interest rate parity, you allow people to make riskless profits. And if you allow people to make riskless profits, they'll try and in the process, they'll drive the parity condition to hold. If you have two currencies, let's say the dollar and the euro, and you have an exchange rate today between the dollar and the euro, and you have interest rates on the dollar and the euro, they're tied together. The forward rate is actually not that informative. It's not an expected exchange rate. It's tied together by interest rate parity. So let's take an example. Let's suppose the current exchange rate is $1.1662 per euro. Let's say the inflation rate in, in US dollars is 2% and the inflation, I'm sorry, the interest rate in US dollars is 2% and the interest rate in euros is 1%. I'm all set. I take 1.1662, today's exchange rate. I use the US dollar interest rate in the numerator and the euro interest rate in the denominator. I get an expected exchange rate of 1.177. I expect the dollar to weaken against the euro because interest rates in the dollar are higher. And think of why this has to hold for arbitrage. If interest rates in one currency are higher than the interest rates in another, it looks to you like it's easy money, right? Just go with the higher interest rates. What this parity condition means is if you go with the currency with the higher interest rates, you have to accept depreciation of the currency. Otherwise, it'll be a, I mean, this is in fact the basis for what's called the carry trade. In fact, the carry trade is built on the presumption that interest rate parity might not hold. So what do people do? They borrow at a low rate. Let's say in the yen has a lower rate than the US dollar and they lend out of the US dollar and they claim to make a riskless profit. If interest rate parity holds, that riskless profit will disappear because those exchange rates will have to move to reflect differences in interest rates. So even if you don't have forward markets, as long as you have interest rates, you can use those interest rates to forecast exchange rates in the future. Of course, for this to work, you need one year rates, two year rates, three year rates in both currencies. And if you have those, you can forecast out rates, exchange rates, even without a forward market out there. Which brings me to the final condition. You think, what if there are no interest rates that go in the long term? There are many emerging market currencies where you can't get one-year rate, two-year rates, three-year rates in that currency going forward. There's another condition that holds. It's not an arbitrage condition. It's a condition built on the presumption that currencies eventually have to buy the same basket of goods. That if you have high inflation in a currency, it will depreciate against a low inflation currency. So let's assume you have two currencies, the US dollar and rupees. And you have a currency exchange rate today between the dollar, between the rupee and the dollar. And I gave you the inflation rate in, that, in, in both currencies. Let's assume for instance, exchange rate is 0.013 dollars per rupee. And the inflation rate is 10% in India and 1% in US dollars. I'm picking very divergent inflation rates for a good reason. So here's what I will expect to see happen over the next year. If that 1% inflation rate and 10% inflation rate, 1% uh, inflation rate in the US dollar and 10% inflation rate in the Indian rupee continue, I would expect the rupee to depreciate roughly 9% next year. That's what you see in the expected exchange rate. And if you want to do it two years from now and the inflation rate is going to stay the same for the next two years, you just rate, you do, do it again, one extra year. Now do you see why this is a very convenient way to forecast exchange rates? Because even if you don't have interest rates, you should be able to make forecasts of inflation. And if those forecasts of inflation hold, I can forecast out exchange rates for the next year, the next five years. So you can go as far as you want as long as you build on that inflation assumption. In this table, for instance, I've taken three currencies against the dollar, the Indian rupee, the Brazilian rei, and the Swiss franc. I've given the rupee 6% inflation rate, the RIAI a 5% inflation rate, and the Swiss franc a 0.5% inflation rate. I'm gonna assume a 2% inflation rate in US dollars. Our forecast out exchange rates for the next year, and for the next 10 years in each currency. Notice what happens. The Indian rupee depreciate, so the Indian rupee in, in this case against the dollar because the inflation rate in rupees is 6% versus the 2% rate, depreciates roughly 4% a year. To get more precise, you have to use that equation you saw on the previous page, roughly 4% a year for the next 10 years. The Brazilian Riyadh depreciates about 3% a year, the difference in inflation rates, 5 minus 2. The Swiss franc appreciates about 1.5% a year. 
purchasing power parity is built on inflation. I'll tell you why I'm a believer in purchasing power parity. To use purchasing power parity, you need inflation rates for the future. You're saying, what if I'm wrong? You know what? It doesn't matter. As long as you're consistently wrong. Let me explain. If you underestimate inflation in the Indian rupee, you're going to underestimate the depreciation of the currency, but you're also going to underestimate the growth rate in Indian rupees. It is one of those mistakes where mistakes cancel out in valuation and analysis. So even if you don't buy into purchasing power parity, it's good to kind of think about what it tells you about the future. I use purchasing power parity in much of what I do in financial analysis. You're going to see this in both my corporate finance and valuation classes. But I hope this session has been useful. Thank you very much for listening.